talk. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining our ETIM Spring 22 series. This is the first in a series of six classes with Rabbi Moshe Shulman. Our class today is Unlocking the Mystery of Midrashic Methodology. I'm looking really, I'm really excited. I, I, I'm, I'm excited most to have the answer to the question, are all Midrashim created equal? That's what I'm looking to find out while we're here. Uh, so we're really privileged today to have Rabbi Shulman here. Rabbi Shulman right now is the spiritual leader of the Young Israel in St. Louis, as he was just telling us the story of the Pearl Head behind him. Um, this is a, the premier family-oriented modern Orthodox synagogue in St. Louis. Um, he's devoting his efforts to advancing the educational depth of the St. Louis community. Um, Rabbi Shulman, you might be able to mute all the participants. Yep, yep, I will do that. Uh, Rabbi Shulman, um, you might get muted in the me in, in the interim. Uh, I'll unmute you. Hang on a second. Okay. Or you can unmute yourself. Sorry about that. No problem. Uh, Rabbi Shulman's also served as the founding dean of Yeshivat Kadima High School and the interim head of school of the Epstein Hebrew Academy in St. Louis. He's taught extensively throughout his career, both in formal and informal educational frameworks. And many of you know as well that one of I his introducing him. former Six positions um, included uh, the rabbi of uh, Shari Shemayim uh, here in Toronto, which is where uh, Torah in Motion head offices are located. So um, I'm sure that's enough of me for now. I'd like to introduce Rabbi Moshe Shulman. And uh, I'm looking forward to the course. Welcome, everybody. And um, if you're not muted, if you could say those people. At your, at your screen, you could have your microphone with a little red line through it. There's a few people, I think, that are not muted. Um, so maybe we can all make sure that we're all muted. So Rabbi, you can a little more, if you don't mind. Thank you. Enjoy. Rabbi Shulman. That's Thank you very you. much. Thank you. I'm just going to mute everybody uh, temporarily and let you unmute yourself uh, if you feel uh, uh, appropriate. Um, I just, first of all, thank you. Thank you, Shira. Thank you to Epi Kelman. Thank you to Torah in Motion for this opportunity. Um, the uh, subject that we're going to explore over the next six weeks is really just a tip of the iceberg. Um, I'm, I'm attempting to do what is probably impossible, which is to address a subject that really needs years and uh, generations of study and analysis. We're going to be addressing in six weeks uh, a, a body of literature that spans almost a thousand years. So uh, it's not really a fair title to say that we're going to unlock the mystery of Midrashic methodology. We're certainly going to explore uh, some of the questions and, and big issues related to how do we understand Midrash and how do we understand Pshat and the interplay between the two. Uh, for the benefit of all, we've prepared a source page. There'll be a source page for each of the six classes. Um, the source pages are primarily in Hebrew. There'll be a little bit of English in some of them where I can get it hand, my hands on a translation fairly easily. Uh, but anything that we will be addressing in this class, uh, I will try to translate. Uh, they are posted on the Torah Motion website. They are also posted in the chat. And, and I will be sharing them on the screen with you all. So I am going to do that right now. So we go straight to the... Uh, okay, and I just need to do one thing. Okay. All right. So I think we are ready to begin. Uh, feel free to keep your video on um, just to kind of keep us engaged. Uh, or if you feel more comfortable with the video off, that's also okay. Uh, we're going to start. The subject at hand is the question of the interplay between the concept of pshat and drash. Pshat meaning the simple reading of the text, pashut, that which is simple, that which is literal. It's often referred to as mashma'o, meaning the literal words or meaning. And the, as we understand it, the word drash, which tends to be a reflection of the word drash, simply means to interpret, doresh to expound, uh, but it's the exposition of 
rabbinic literature through the era of the Mishnah, the Talmud, and the scholars of the period of the Talmud who write in uh, various works known as the Midrash. So I want to start our conversation with a Gemara in Masechet Shabbat, which is a halachic discussion related to the question of wearing uh, garments of war, elements of items of war, a sword, a bow, etc., on Shabbat. Uh, not our topic, so the context, the halachic context of this is not relevant to us for now. But in the context of a verse that the Gemara quotes, the Gemara says, well, wait a second, that verse is really talking about something else. It's talking about Divrei Torah. There's a drasha about a person should wear their sword, meaning the sword of Torah. Says the Gemara, Amalei, Ein mikra yotze midei pshuto. Your drash, your interpretation, your exposition is correct. However, the verse does not depart from its literal meaning. Ein mikra yotze midei pshuto. This is the core verse, the core quote from the Gemara that will become the kind of the epicenter of all of the discussions related to midrash. Chazal themselves make this declaration. Ein mikra yotze midei pshuto. The text does not depart from its literal meaning, even though I have a Midrashic exposition that seems to interpret it in a different fashion. So there is a halachic discussion, and then there is the pshat of the verse. And Chazal themselves recognized that they both have a power, credence, credibility, importance. Then the Gemara goes on to tell a little bit of a story of this rabbi of Rav Kahana, who said, I never knew that, that there is such a concept of the literal meaning of the text, and there's a whole discussion about it, but that is at the center of the discussion. Um, I also want to, at the outset, um, recognize that when we talk about Midrash, we tend to lump all Midrash together. We tend to talk about Midrash or Drash as a kind of a monolithic equal to the rabbis say, or the Medrash says. Um, they've even published books called The Medrash Says. We can talk about my view on those books at a different time, but uh, <laughs> offline. But there is a notion of the Medrash as this kind of monolithic view of rabbinic, of the rabbinic view or outlook or interpretation. So first thing we need to do is recognize that we use the word Midrash for two different bodies of literature, and they're very important to distinguish between them. We have what is known as the Midrash Halacha. Midrash Halacha is a forerunner to the Mishnah and the Talmud. It's essentially a halachic exposition of each verse in the Torah, deriving from the verses the various halachot pertaining to the oral law, the oral tradition, Torah Shabal Peh. There are essentially there are essentially four books of halacha in Torah. Breshit doesn't have a halachic status in terms of the medrash, but the verses that are expounded for halachic purposes are from Shmos, Ba'ikub, Midbar, and Tvarim. And so we have midrashe halacha on those books. On Sefer Shmot, we have what is known as the Mechilta, two versions of the Mechilta. In Vayikra, we have what is known as Torah Kohanim, or the Sifra. In Bamidbar, we have a book called the Sifrei. In Dvarim, we have the Sifrei, or the Medrash Tanoim. And those are the books known as Midrash Halacha. From those Psukim, through this Midrash, we learn, we derive Halachic uh, derivations, and they are codified in the Mishnah and in the Talmud. They actually predate the Mishnah. There's a second body of literature, which is the primary focus of this course, which is what we refer to as Agadata, or Midrash Hagada, or homiletic Midrashim, or expositions of that are non-halachic in nature. And they span a thousand years. They are as varied as they come, and they're written at different times, meaning they're sourced at different pla- in different places. There's Babylonian Midrashim, there's is Midrash, Midrash Agada, or books of Midrash that are sourced in the Jerusalem Talmud era. Uh, we refer to it as the Midrash Rabba, but there are really five different books: Breshit Rabba, Shmot Rabba, Vayikra Rabba, Bamidbar Rabba, Dvarim Rabba, the Midrashim of uh, the, the Megillot Rabba. Uh, there's a Psikta, there's a Tanchuma, there's Pirkei Rabbi Eliezer, there's Tanah de Beliau. There are many different works of Midrashim that are collections. 
of, Midrash, of Midrashim from the period of Chazal that spans almost a thousand years. And it's that vast sea of homiletic and agadic Midrashim that our quest to understand uh, this m- literature and how it applies or how it guides us in our understanding of Pshat is the centerpiece of our discussion. Um, there is a tendency today to refer to Medrash in a kind of a... How should I put it? We, we tend to look at Pshat as almost like Pshat is the true interpretation and Medrash is a kind of a... Ah, it's just a Medrash. And we dismiss it. In our quest to understand Tanakh, and today it's become very popular and very central to our study of Tanakh, to seek out the world of Pshat, the simple meaning of the text, but we do so at the expense, very often, of a serious approach to Midrash by simply dismissing it. We look at the Pshat, we say, that's Wait, but what's the real pshat? Okay, what's the, these are expressions you, get, you hear often. What's the real pshat? Or that's just a medrash. And what I want to do is twofold, and it's a bit of a challenge, challenging task, but I want to, on the one hand, understand where pshat and drash differ in methodology, particularly focusing on midrash, but also uh, a, a sort of what are, the, what are the boundaries, what are the limitations of rabbinic interpretation, rabbinic literature in terms of Chazal, and their interpretation of the text? How bound are we to that in terms of our freedom of interpretation uh, today um, and through the, through the ages? So we certainly have a tendency to uh, kind of uh, dismiss Midrash, almost like a simplistic or superficial type of, of dismissal, without really giving it a serious approach and serious attitude, and that's part of what I want to look at in this course. The authority of Midrash, the Midrashic stories that seem to be out of touch with the text and where they come from, and then the Midrashic tendency to kind of reinterpret biblical persona and biblical stories that seems to negate the text itself. Those are essentially the three main areas that we're going to focus on in this course. There's much more to be discussed. We're going to, as I said, uh, whet our appetites for much more, but uh, there's going to be more left unsaid than said, but that is the nature of this kind of a survey. Um, I've divided this course up into six sessions, and I've kind of given an outline here at the top of the source page. The first we're going to address today is the authority of Midrash. What is the what is the authority? What are the limitations of Midrash? Then I want to explore in more depth this phrase, en pshuto, the literal meaning of the text, and really look into what is the sort of the centerpiece or the epicenter of this debate, which is Rashi. Because Rashi, on the, on the one hand, defines himself as a commentary whose focus is pshat, whose focus is a simple reading of the text, and yet I would argue that nine out of ten midrashim that we are all familiar with, we know from our study of Rashi, who quotes midrashim extensively. So I want to look at that as a subject into itself. Uh, the third unit, which we're going to divide into two classes, is what I call the midrashic story, or stories that the Medrash introduces into the biblical sto- into the biblical narrative that seem to be completely t- disconnected from the text. Stories like Avraham Avinu being thrown into the fiery furnace of Nimrod, which we all know, we all quote, we all talk about Avraham escapes the fires of Nimrod, but that story is not in Chumash, and so where does it come from? Stories like that will become the subject of sessions three and four, and finally, the last two sessions, I want to deal with probably the most controversial topic, which is the uh, sense of reinterpretation that we often find in uh, Midrashic literature, and in particular, the story of the sins of some of our great leaders of our people, like David Amalek, and the tendency in some circles to kind of try to reinterpret or whitewash that, uh, that's those stories. And we'll deal with the famous story of Shmuel Menachmeni, who says... Uh, all anyone who says that so and so sinned is mistaken. What does that mean? So those are the kind of the, those are the six 
course, the outline of the six classes that we have and the three major topics we're going to address. I'm going to do something very unfair, which is I'm going to tell you now the punchline of my six-week course. Um, the punchline of where I want to get to is a very simple conclusion. And that is that I believe very strongly that Midrashim do not necessarily need to be taken literally, but they need to be taken seriously. And I've used that line often. I think it's at the core of how we approach Midrash and Pshat in to see each in its context and what they contribute to each other. So I'm going to start with one extreme. And we're going to start with the extreme of the question of what is the authority of biblical interpretation from the vantage point of when we look at a text and I have a body of literature out there that gives an a particular interpretation, Midrash, Midrash al Midrash Agada. How, how much am I bound by that interpretation? How much freedom do I have to offer alternative readings of the text? Um, so I want to start actually with this quote from the Sifrei, which, as I said, is a uh, part of the Midrash Halacha. The Medrash here is working on a verse in Tvarim that says that uh, if you will observe all of the commandments, Kim Shavot Yishmunot Kol Mitzvah Zot, which I will command you today to love God and to walk in His ways. And the Medrash says, k- picks up on this double language, Shamar Tishmurun and uh, uh, Kol HaMitzvah, all of this mitzvah which I command you today. And the Medrash makes the following declaration. I'm really interested in one piece of it, which is that Lo uh, Tamar Lamadati Halachot Dai, don't say that just the study of Halacha is in itself sufficient. Therefore, the Torah says, Kol HaMitzvah, the entirety of the mitzvah, meaning not just the halacha or bottom line of how to, what to do, but also Midrash, Halachot, Hagadot. There's a verse that says, Not by bread alone does man live, Lo alechem levado yichyeh ha'adam. That's referring to Midrash, Ki al-kom pi Hashem. These are Halachot and Hagadot. The Medrash is essentially saying the totality of Midrashic literature, Midrash, Halacha, Agada. Uh, all of this is important for our study, for our total understanding of a text, a verse, an understanding of God's intention, will uh, from the Torah. And that would seem to elevate the world of Midrash and Haggadah to a uh, central, a, pr- a central role in our interpret- interpretation of Tanakh. On the other hand, you have this statement in the Yerushalmi. That says, Ein morin lo mina lachot lo mina agadot lo mina tosafot ela mina tamud. That when it comes to hora'a, when it comes to halacha, when it comes to psak, when it comes to a the oral Torah, and how we are to conduct our lives, normative halachic positions, we derive them from the conclusions in the Talmud, and not from the earlier sources of agadata and t- brightot and other materials, the Talmud is sort of this collection. And so we have this principle of Ein Morin Min Halacha, we don't paskin from a halacha, from a, from a medvish. Uh, this was addressed by the Node of Yehuda, who suggests um, a very powerful uh, tshuva addressing this question, that there is a distinction to be made between halacha and agarata. Um, and so he writes here at the end, uh, if we're dealing with halachic information, halachic literature, then we can rely on the totality of Midrash Halacha, the Brightot, etc. When it comes to the homiletic or agadic Midrashim, Ikar kavanatam ala musa ve ala remazim ve ala mishalim. The primary intent of the rabbis in this literature called Midrash Agada is the lessons and the hints and the parables and the philosophy. And all of that's very important. That's all fundamental. But they're not intending to paskin a Shiloh. They're not intending to paskin from those psukim if it's in a homiletic context. 
and therefore ein lemedim mehem lepsak halacha, we don't derive from them any psak. In other words, this is the source of a very important principle called ein mishivin aladrush. We do not use hamaletic midrashim for halachic foundation of source of um, uh, normative halachic practice, uh, because agadic midrashim operate on a different set of principles, on a different set of criteria than halachic material. Halachic material is binding. Halachic material is the foundation of the oral Torah that has a tradition that goes all the way back to Har Sinai. Agadic, homiletic, sermonic interpretation, as we'll see very quickly, doesn't have that same foundation. It doesn't have that same authority. What authority it has, we'll explore. But it has a very different authoritative basis than does halachic material, and hence I started this discussion with the distinction between the world of Midrash Halacha and the world of Midrash Agada. Midrash Halacha is binding. It's the foundation of the Oral Torah. The question of how binding and how compelling the extraordinary breadth of Midrash Agada is in our interpretation of Tanakh, that's the question that we need to explore. And um, at the beginning of our discussion, I want to share with you, a, maybe not, the, um, I want to share with you the, this statement of the Chazanish, um, and, and uh, my purpose in sharing this with you is not to debate the Chazanish and uh, uh, the, integri- the, the, the veracity of what he's suggesting. It's more of a foil to kind of see a contrast between one extreme position and what I hope to reflect will be a different position in the course of today's presentation. Um, the Chazanish, I would argue, more for almost educational philosophical reasons, dealing with contemporary issues, uh, takes a position that every Midrash is absolutely binding. He writes, Mishosheha Emuna, Shakola Neemar Bagmara, Ben Bemishna, Ben Bagmara, Ben Bahalacha, Ben Baagada. Everything in the Gemara, whether it's in a halacha context or in an agadic homiletic um, context, Heim Dvarim Shinit Kalula Noayade Koch Nivui. They are part of this oral tradition that was revealed to us from Sinai through the power of prophecy. Koch Nishika Shal Sechel Netzal. And therefore, we are very disturbed by the suggestion that there are those who would question the words of Chazal, ben ba'alacha, ben ba'agada, whether it be in halacha context or in agada context. And he says that that is heresy, kishma shal giduv. And anybody who veers from the agada interpretation is kofir b'divr chazal, is denying the words of chazal. Chazanish is a very extreme, what I would call very literal, reading of Midrash, who argues that whether it's halachic material or whether it's agadic material, if it's in the Gemara, it's binding both in our interpretation of Tanakh as well as in our understanding of the worldview. And I would argue, for, for whatever reasons the Chazanish took this position, is not my discussion, that's really a, a whole different discussion on contemporary streams of Judaism, um, but I would argue that I, I would strongly distinguish between these two domains. When it comes to halacha, I think the Chazanish is 100% correct. When it comes to agadic or midrashic interpretation, I think there's a far greater amount of leeway and freedom of interpretation then would seem to be reflected in this statement of the Chazanish. And it's that position that I want to support, demonstrate for you today. And so we're going to do a walkthrough. Um, Today's class, perhaps more than others, is going to be very textual, but I want to do a walkthrough of a host of comments or statements, quotations from post-Talmudic sources dealing with the question of what is agada, and how binding is agada, or Midrash, as we refer to it often. From the time of the Gaonim, with the sages 
between the period of the Talmud and the period of the Rishonim, through the Rishonim, through Achronim, through contemporary sources, what is this sort of consensus, what is the consensus of the majority position traditionally around this question? And when I say, what I share with you may sound somewhat controversial, uh, that's okay, but I, I just, I think it's important for us to see it from the outset. Let's start with this statement of Rav Haigon. I'm just going to do one little technical thing on my computer, so give me a minute. Okay. All right. So here's a quote from the period of the Gaonim. Rav Haigon and Rav Shurigon, two of the classic uh, halachic positions of the Gaonim, from which all of the Rishonim built their positions. Rebbeinu Haigon Katav, this is what he wrote. You should know, have you yodim, ki divrei agada, when it comes to our understanding of agadic, midrashic material, lav kishmu'ahim, they're not the same as shmu'ah, meaning that which is transmitted from generation to generation that goes back to Sinai. Ella, listen to this, kol echad doresh ma'she'ala libo, each one of the rabbis, when they approached a verse, if it was in the Agadic context, they interpret the verse as they saw and as they felt was appropriate, not based on a tradition or Masoret that they got from Sinai. In other words, the, the oral law, the halachic structure of Judaism, is built upon a Masoret that traces its way back to what we call halacha l'moshe misinai. From Sinai, the written Torah, the oral Torah. That's true when it comes to halachic interpretation. It's not true, says Rav Haigon, when it comes to homiletic or agadic interpretations. But rather, kugon efshir v'yishlom are possibilities, suggestions, not absolutes, lo davar and therefore, says Rav Haigon, Ein somchim alehem. We're not bound by them. We're not forced to, in, in, to similarly interpret in accordance with the way they interpreted. El Ef Shabola. Rav Shri Ragon makes a similar comment. He writes, uh, All of these interpretations from text, which are called Midrash and Agada, they are assessments, the rabbinic assessments. They looked at the text and they evaluated what it could be. And therefore, it's not based on a Masoret they received, but rather that they conceived. We are not bound by these Agadic interpretations. We don't derive halachic positions from these Agadot. That which is logical, that which is textually supported, we can buy, if you will. But if it doesn't make sense to us, if it's not logical to us, if it doesn't have textual support, we're not bound to by that interpretation. We're free to offer our own interpretation. So says Rav Shririga. It's an extraordinary sweeping statement that separates the world of halachic midrashim from the world of agadic midrashim. One is binding, one is absolute, one is part of a masorat of Toshim al one is not. One is the rabbis looked at texts, they interpreted them homiletically, philosophically, metaphorically, but they were interpreting. And if they were allowed to interpret, so are we, says Rosh Shifting from the world of the Gaonim to the world of the Rishonim, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th century scholars. One of the uh, most famous addresses to this question is a uh, text known as uh, Mavoa Talmud, the introduction to the Gemara, and that appears that, that was written by Shmuel Hanagid, an 11th century Spanish scholar. It appears at the end of most of the Gemaras, the Vilna Shas, the end of Tractate Brachot, the first tractate in Shas. And he has in the back there a kind of a, expo, a, 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 a essay on each type of material that you're going to find in the Gemara. Uh, 
You're going to find Mishnah in the Gemara. You're going to find Breiter in the Gemara. You're going to find Tosefta in the Gemara. You're going to find Midrashe Halacha in the Gemara. You're going to find Midrashe Agada in the Gemara. You're going to find it all. And so Shmuel and Nagid separates them all and says, okay, what's a Ibaya? What's a question? What's a Kasha? What, is the, what are the words of the Talmud? It's a, it's a methodological analysis of all of the pieces of the Talmud. It's a fascinating read in and of itself, independent of this class. But there he explains the word Hagada. And he says, what is Agada? Hagada, Agada, it's the same, same, one is Aramaic, one is Hebrew. He says, Rav Shmuel and Nagid, Kol perush Talmud, any interpretation that appears in the Talmud, al shuminyan, on any matter, shelo yiyeh mitzvah, which is not a mitzvah, which is not halachically binding, but rather it's textual, it's about biblical history, it's about biblical stories, it's about whatever it is. But if it's not halachic in nature, zui hagada, that's agada. Okay? But he goes further and he says, And you're only bound to accept it and to learn from it if what you derive from it is logical, is rational, makes sense to you. So understand, anything that Chazal say with regards to a mitzvah, with regards to a halacha, that's mipi Moshe Rabbeinu, that comes down in the Masorat from Moshe Rabbeinu, that comes down in the, the structure of Torah Shabbat. Can't add to it, can't detract from it. But that which they interpreted in the text of the Torah, everyone interpreted according to how they understood the text. What they saw as logical, Mashu Abedato. And therefore, Mashi Alela, that mina perishima elulum dimertam. Therefore, we are compelled, we are bound, we are to accept their words if they make sense to us, if they are logical to us, if, they, if we see that same interpretation. But if not, Hashar, ain some criminal him, we don't have to rely on them. The Rambam. Or Rabbi Avram ben Rambam, in this case, the Rambam's son, Rabbi Avram ben Rambam, similarly made a similar a, an, the argument, perush lepsukim, t- interpretation of text, which are not dependent upon a um, or are not a dependent are, are not part of the foundations of Jewish law, lo bedim Torah, they're not halachic in nature, and therefore we do not have to accept them. El lefiach atadat. Only that which makes sense to us, which is logical to us. Um, and this is a, uh, a theme that carries through many of the uh, writings of the Rishonim. I'm going to skip a few sources for a minute. Let's jump to the uh, towards the latter part of the period of the Rishonim. The Sh- I'll come back to the Ramban in a second. Uh, the Shilta Giborim. Shilta Giborim was a 15th century Italian scholar named Yeshua Boaz. It appears in the back of the Gemara in the Rif on many t- tractates, and there he writes, the Midrashot Emunahim is the the Midrashim that we're describing, these homiletic uh, interpretations. Are they part of our foundation of faith? They're there to interpret, they're there to expound our body of understanding and to receive reward for, t- for, for learning, but they're not there to compel us to that has to be the only interpretation. The rabbinic interpretation was there to expand our understanding of the text, not to compel us into a particular interpretation. And to offer many different kinds of possible interpretations, anything that uh, the text would uh, would tolerate. Uh, similarly, the Sefer Chinuch, says that anybody who adds to this interpretation, who offers their own interpretation, we shouldn't criticize them, but rather uh, that is praiseworthy to expand in the study of Torah and the study of Tanakh new insights and new interpretations. We'll see that in much more detail next week. Um, in the world of the... I'm going to come back to this Ramban for a moment, um, just keeping an eye on the clock for a second. But in the world of the Rishonim, 
This Ramban is really a centerpiece of a major controversy. Um, nobody said this more articulately and more directly than the Ramban, but he said it in a very interesting context. The very famous story of uh, Nachmanides, Ramban, uh, involved in a disputation with uh, Fry Paul. Um, the story to this disputation in public debate with, with, with the representative of the, of the Catholic Church is a famous story. Ultimately, it... Uh, um, it was very common in the Middle Ages for these kinds of public disputes to be required. And the Ramban uh, d- defended the Jewish people against the attacks of the church in this very famous disputation, so referred to as Sefer Havikuach, or the disputation. And one of the questions that Fry Paul challenged him on was, uh, if, Mesh- if the Savior, the, Mesh- the Messiah, Mba Mashiach, if the Mashiach had already come, and he quotes the Medrash that, and they were very knowledgeable in Talmudic literature, and he quotes a Medrash that says, um, okay. uh, he quotes a Medrash that says, sorry, um, that the Mashiach was born in Tishabab, and therefore the Mashiach has already come. I said, Mashiach Loba, I'm writing, our, our Mashiach has not yet come. And he brought an agada that says that on the day that the temple was destroyed, Bomayom Nolad, on that day he was born. Amarti Ani, I said, says the Ramban, She'eni ma'amin baze. I don't accept that medvish. I don't believe that medvish. In other words, he doesn't challenge that medrash from the perspective of it's not text, it's not true, right? he's not dealing with the text. He's dealing with the statement of the rabbis in the Gemara that says that the Mashiach was born in Tisha B'Av, the day the temple was destroyed. Says the Ramban, I don't believe that medrash. You can't prove that to, to, to me. And he says, And I'll explain why. He says, no, we have three types of books. One is called the Bible, also known as Tanakh. And we accept this text without question. The second is called Talmud, or as I described it earlier, the Halachic corpus of Midrash Halacha, Midrash, uh, Mishnah, to Sef, to Gemara, etc. Which is a comment or interpretation of the mitzvot of the Torah. But there are 613 mitzvot in the Torah, and every one of them is expanded and expounded and halachically applied based on this Masorat of Torah Shabbat called the Talmud. And we accept the Talmud at face value in every way as it applies to the normative Jewish halachic process. We have a third book, Hanikra Midrash, referred to as Midrash. Now listen to how he translates the word Midrash. Sermons! I'm a rabbi. I give sermons every week. I know what a sermon is. Sermons. It would be like one of your priests getting up in the church and giving a sermon, and one of the listeners liked it, and he wrote it down. That is the book or the collection that we call Midrash. The rabbis gave sermons, and their students wrote them down. Vizeh Sefer, as it pertains to this third body of corpus of, of information, Mishi Batov, If you believe it, great. If you don't, no harm come, no harm done. Now, this caused a storm, as you can imagine. And Back and forth, the question was, was that the Ramban wrote this or said this because he was debating Fry Paul and he needed to kind of dismiss this argument out of hand, and so he took a most extreme position, but one that he himself did not believe, says 
say some of the interpretations that he said one thing but he denied it in his heart or did the Ramban actually stand by this position I'm not going to go through all of the sources but the Ramban in Emunah V'Pitachon the Ramban in Hasagot L'Sefer Mitzvot the Ramban in many places argues the similar line that I showed you in the Rishonim and in the Gonim namely Chazal did not say that there's nothing but the pshat. We have a medrash and we have pshat, and they're two different domains. And the text can tolerate the midrashic interpretation, and the text can tolerate a pshat interpretation. They're different, and they're not necessarily um, binding one on the other. Uh, and so that really is the the line of reasoning from the period of the Gaonim through the Rishonim, uh, really up until contemporary times, the period of the Achronim. Uh, and that's where we f- sort of get into a little bit more of a complex world with those who took a more fundamental literal reading of Midrashic literature, as I showed you in the Chazanish, to those who maintained this kind of uh, approach that Midrashim are very important, rabbinic writings, but they're not necessarily pshat, they're not binding on us in terms of our interpretation of pshat. Which brings us to the contemporary sources. I wanted to share with you two. One is the Orachayim HaKadosh. The Orachayim, again, we haven't even begun to touch upon the question of Biblical exegesis, as it's referred to, or Pashanut, which is the Mepharshim, Rashi, Ramban, Radak, Ibn Ezra, Sforna, right? with the classic Mepharshim, open up a Chumash, a Mikro'ok Dalot, and you have all the classic inter- um, Mepharshim there. Uh, we will deal with their approach to this question next week. That's the subject for next week's discussion. But I share with you here two quotes related to uh, this issue. One from the Orachayim Akadosh, he says, "Da ki rishut lanu netuna lefi mashmuot aktovim benetinat ayun viyishuv adat." No, the permission is given to us to interpret the texts literally, based on our own understanding, our own analysis, and our own um, insight. Hagam shekadmunu rishonim, even though. The scholars of the earlier period, Mishnaic period, came before us, and they interpreted the texts differently. That's possible. There are 70 faces to Torah. And we're not bound by their interpretation in any way unless it changes a halachic law. If it changes a law of an interpretation we want to offer would change a halacha, then we bow to the gener- to the sages of the Mishnah and the Talmud. But if it's just if it's homiletic, if it's textual, if it's to understand the stories, then we are free to interpret as we see the text. In this domain, the last co- source I want to share with you is of Shimon Fal Hirsch. Shimon Fal Hirsch adds a very important component to this discussion. Um, and he says, he says the same thing that we've been seeing in all the sources up until now. Um, talks about this distinction between halacha and agada. That ein uh, lemedim halacha agada. You can't derive halacha from agada. Agada is one domain. Halacha is another. Vechem bedin. The interpretations, what we call drash, medrash, is not based on a masoret from Sinai. This is the core piece. It's not. Halacha is. Midrash is not. If it was based on a Kabbalah from, from Sinai, we made a brit, we made a commitment, we took an oath. That we would ba- abide by the by the law as set down by at Sinai, that's true in the halachic domain. But midrash is simply the assessment of whatever whichever, whichever rabbi is being quoted. However, 
V'leiv adam, anybody who's got a brain in their heads and a heart to understand, V'leiv samech v'nefesh chafetz yakuf rosho ladat koch hacham v'chacham v'chazal. We would bow our heads in humility of, of, of the highest order in face of the rabbis of the Talmud. Right? They were our rabbis, they were our scholars. We, we, we drink their waters. So we're not going to dismiss them. Even though he's not quoting a Kabbalah that he received from Sinai in this Midrashic story or this Midrashic text, he's only interpreting the text as he sees it. But all of them, I mean, one of them is better, is more, is more significant and greater than all of us together. We are like grasshoppers compared to them. Which is a quote from the story of the spies. But it's not obligatory. It's not obligatory. Nor would I be considered a heretic. If our attempt to understand the Pshat differs from that of Chazal. We are ob- and this is the approach, and he quotes, Rav Shmira Gon, Rav Hai Gon, Rav Nisim Gon, Rav Hanano, uh, the Ritva, all of them who offered other interpretations that are different than that of the Midrash. So, I come back to what I said at the very beginning of this shir today, which is my conclusion, my basis of my conclusion, both of today and at the end of our series, is that while Midrashim need to be taken seriously, because they are expressions and insights and interpretations of rabbinic leaders of our people from the period of the mission in the Talmud, the, those that carry the weight of the Masorot of Torah Shabbat, but they don't necessarily bind us, they're not obligatory upon us when we approach a text. When we approach a text, we have the ability of, or the freedom of interpretation, we are, ob- we are obliged, I would say, to take the medvish into account and to take it seriously, but not necessarily to interpret exclusively based on that midrash. That's old one domain. Are there any examples that come to mind that you could share with us now, or this is too um, early to do that? Of where we would offer interpretations that are different? Sure, there are many. Chazal say we were in Mitzrayim for 210 years. Because even though the text says we were there for 400 years, Chazal have a whole calculation of, the, of that 400 reference to 400 years to the birth of Yitzchak. Many Mepharshim accepted that view of, the, of Chazal. There were many others in Mikro'ok Dalot who said, no, text says we were in Mitzrayim for 400 years. We were in Mitzrayim for 400 years, which means we have to um, reinterpret our whole biblical chronology. But that's what they do. Ebenezra, Barbanel, and others. So uh, that's, a, that's a simple example. Where the Mepharshim looked at a text, they looked at a corpus of Midrashim, and they offered interpretations that are different. And, um, and and we're going to look at that in more details when we get into some of the examples, but um, that's, a, that's a very simple example and a, and a very powerful one. Um, there, were, there were many others, but... Okay. S- part two for today. And we have a few minutes. I want to d- address this last issue because this is very, uh, very important. Um... And that is, we've talked about whether Midrashim are binding. The second question that in the methodological approach to reading Midrash, to studying Midrash, is are Midrashim literal? Meaning, there is a host of Midrashim that are, sound outlandish. Are we bound by the literal reading of the Midrash? I'll give you an example. We all know the famous comment Rashi makes that uh, four fifths of our people died in Egypt, right? You all know them died in the plague of darkness, which is quoted all the time. Um, it bothers me a little bit, but that's a separate hum- this is a separate polemic. It's quoted all the time. Four fifths of our people died in Egypt. Rashi quotes it. Rashi quotes it as the second of two interpretations. He quotes the first interpretation that's different, and then he quotes this one. If four fifths of our people died in Egypt and 600,000 males above the age of 20 left Egypt, 
That means, do, do the numbers, 600,000 males above the age of 20 doesn't include, the, doesn't include the wives and the children, which means that you're talking about, let's assume at the smaller end, 2 million people left Egypt, at the smaller end. If four-fifths of our people died in Egypt, that means that our people saw, were of the size of 10 million people or more. I, I can't see 10 million Israelites in Egypt. It just doesn't make sense. So, did Chazal mean that literally? Or did, were they talking metaphorically? And there's a host of these Midrashim. There's a Medrash Rashi quotes in Sefer Dvarim that talks about the battle with Og, one of the giants. And Rashi says that Moshe Rabbeinu was ten amot tall, and his hand, was, his sword, could reach ten amot high. And he could jump ten amot in the sky. And when he jumped up with his ten amot sword, and he was ten amot tall, he reached up to thirty amot, he reached the ankle of Og Melech So says Rashi. Understand an amot is two feet. Are you telling me that Moshe Rabbeinu was 10 feet tall? No, sorry, was 20 feet tall? And that he had a sword that was 20 feet tall? And that he could jump 20 feet in the air? It's absurd. Are we compelled to the literal reading of these Midrashim? This was another polemic that took place in the days in the Middle Ages. And I want to share with you a couple of uh, insights. We have uh, nine minutes. Um, I... I I will apologize at the outset that I have so much material I want to share with you that I'm going to take us to the end and I'm not going to really have a lot of time for questions. I would invite you all, if you have questions, please feel free, email them to me. Um, we'll spend a few minutes after class if you want to stay on for a few minutes. Uh, I just, I don't want to take, um, I, I just want to make sure we get through the bulk of the material. Two classic exposés on the literal, the question of the literal reading of Midrashim appear in the Rambam and in the writings of the, the Rambam's son, Rabbi Avram ben Rambam. The Rambam in his Akadama is introduction to Sanhedrin, which is one of the chapters, or Perak one of the chapters of the Gemara in Sanhedrin that deals with most of the Agadot pertaining to Messianism and Yimot HaMashiach. And so the Rambam has a long introduction to that Perak. And there he writes that there are basically three approaches to Medrash that appear in our, in society. Amongst the rabbis, amongst the approach of uh, the people of Israel, he has found three different approaches to Medrash. And he has a very clear view on which one is right and which one's wrong. He says, Hakata Rishana, the first group, they understand everything the rabbis say is literal. And it is a foundation of their faith to suggest that the rabbis spoke only in absolute literal terms. If the rabbi said that Moshe Rabbeinu was ten amat high, he was ten amat high. If four or five-fifths of our people died in the plague of Egypt, four-fifths of our people died in the plague of, plague of, Egypt, of darkness, everything's literal. Even if it was impossible in the logic, compelling of logic of, of natural order. But rather, it is. These people interpret these Midrashim literally because they're fools that way. And because they don't have an ounce of understanding of science. Which is a harsh way of putting it, but that's the Rambam. Um, and he writes, Hakatazum. It's a, it's a Rachmanus on their foolishness because in their effort to elevate the words of our rabbis they're actually degrading the words of our rabbis they are lowering them to the level of, of being subject to derision and mockery because other people will listen to these words, they'll listen to these midrashim that sound outlandish, that sound impossible. If they take them literally, they're going to say, okay, then the rab- if that's what the rabbis meant, then the rabbis are fools. And you're causing a chil al That's what the Rambam writes. That's group A. Group B is the second group, meaning... They also interpreted the rabbi's words literally, but they thought that they're so foolish that 
ונגו, וגנוהו, וחשבו למוזר, מה שאינו מוזר. They, they, they dismissed the rabbinic interpretations. They made fun of them. ילעיגו על דברי חכמים. They would make fun of the words of the rabbis, because if you're telling me that they're literal and they're absurd, then any rabbi who would make such a statement is absurd, and therefore they excluded themselves and dismissed the entire corpus. And uh, most of the people he writes who fell into this category are doctors and scientists, etc. They, people, people of science, people of rational interpretation, but their understanding of rabbinic literature was such that they couldn't accept a literal reading of the rabbi's words. Be'akata Shlishit, the third group, Ve'hem Chayashem Me'atimor, they are the minority, says the Rambam. They are those who understand that the rabbi spoke in metaphor. She'ma'lehem ha'shalom lo dibru divrei havai v'nitberet, they didn't speak nonsense, nitberet zam sh'yesh b'divreihem pshat v'sod. There is, in the words of these midrashim, a simple reading of the Medrash, but a deeper, more philosophical understanding of what the rabbis meant. And everything that the rabbi said about anything that was impossible, that was irrational, that was not natural, Shem bilti ev shariyim, ein divrehem bekach ela al derech achida be'amashal. These are words of parables. These are words of metaphor. They're not to be taken literally. If you take it literally, you end up with an absurdity, and the rabbis were far smarter than the absurdities to which we have left the world of Medvish. This is one of the reasons, and I'll just put it out there for now, it's one of the reasons why I have such a visceral negative reaction to books like the Medrash says. Because when we take these midrashim and we turn them into folk stories, as if they are historical fact, but they're absurd in their logic and their compelling and their, and, and their interpretations, we do Chazal a tremendous disservice. So says, so writes the Rambam. Rabbi Avram ben Rambam, similarly, he divides five, he recognizes five different kinds of midrashim, some of which are textual, some of which are about stories of the rabbis, some of which are philosophical, but the last category, which is about what we're dealing with, which is homiletic interpretation of texts, he says many of them are Mahmadei Ashir, they're parables. They're written in a kind of a philosophical language of drashot that are, uh, are um, meant to have a deeper meaning. And that is the majority of the Midrashim, says the Rambam. Um, similarly, the Shilta Giborim, when I, the Rishon that I quoted earlier, he says that because there are many in our generation that make fun of the words of the rabbis because they don't understand the depth to which the rabbis spoke, so he's going to suggest that there are three kinds of midrashim. There are those midrashim which the rabbi spoke in an exaggerated form. It's very common. The rabbis used exaggeration to drive home a point. I would argue that the comment about four-fifths is an exaggeration. Because they wanted to drive home a point that there were those who didn't want to go. But it's Derech Kuzma. Or, there are things that the rabbis describe in Midrashim that are about Nisim, great miracles that the Kaddish Baruch Hu does for our people. And the third, Lidrosh HaMikra Bechol Inyan Shicholin Lidrosh. To give an interpretation of any possible interpretation that can be tolerated by the text in the Drash context, um, to expand our sense of what the texts are about, and to uh, see that there is v'chol midrashim and midrashim yesh behem shu ikar karov lepshat v'yesh behem sheyesh beremes. Some of them are literal, some of them are textual, and some of them are allusions and hints and metaphors and and and, and references to sit to deep philosophical concepts, but not the literal reading of the text. So, I'm going to stop sharing here and come back to the thesis with which I began, which is that you know, the corpus of literature known as Midrash is anything but monolithic. It's not one book called The Medrash Says. It's not one book that reads a Midrashic narrative to Tanakh. It's complex 
insights. Some are textual, some are Tanakh, broad scope Tanakh concepts. Some are philosophical ideas that Chazal couched in language that was symbolic. Um, and, and there's so many examples, almost too many examples to kind of, of um, uh, to kind of summarize on one on one foot. But uh, you know, the, I, I gave this year a, a shear before Shabbos uh, Shabbos Agadol on an entire shear for an hour, an hour and a quarter on one word of a medvish. Right? The, the pasuk says that Lot fed the malachim matzot, which simply means cakes, bre- cakes. The Medrash says he fed them cakes because it was Pesach. Now, there's no reference in the text anywhere that it was Pesach. Rashi quotes it. But when you start to dig down deep to the philosophical framework of what Chazal was trying to tell you, what themes of Pesach emanate from the story of Lot, suddenly you recognize there's a depth to what they were trying to convey. Not a literal reading of the text, but a philosophical understanding that is much broader than simply one verse. And that's an approach that we're going to explore in much more detail when we get into Midrashic stories, as well as into uh, statements of the rabbis that seem to reinterpret Midrashic uh, Tanakh um, biblical events. So we're going to look at it from both of those perspectives. That's my presentation for today. Midrashim don't necessarily need to be taken literally, but they need to be taken seriously. And with that, I will stop. And uh, we've reached the end of the time. Uh, I'm happy to stay on for a few more minutes and answer questions if there are. But um, the yeah. class officially has come to a, an end. Rabbi, you, you mentioned that it would be okay for people Absolutely. to send you questions via email. Absolutely. Okay. And um, which email address would you like me to put into the chat? Uh, Mila.net. Okay. at Mila.net. Okay. I'll put that one in. Just a second. Please. Uh, uh, Yes. Yeah. Uh, So first of all, I want to thank you very much for this approach, which is the approach that I personally uh, share since high school when we used to fight this out. We had one teacher who said literally, and I had a friend who argued that person down. I want to ask you this. Considering that you marshaled so many sources that show that certainly there are two positions on this, when will the day come where you won't have to introduce yourself as being controversial? <laughs> I mean, why is it? I, I would argue. It, yeah, go ahead. Why is it that that uh, modern Orthodox education, right, does not emphasize this position, even still, I think, as much as you know, the more traditional uh, uh, positions of taking things literally. I mean, what is what are people so afraid of? I, I don't have a really good answer to that question. I know that it's... I know. <laughs> I, I, I know it certainly drives much of how I teach Tanakh, and I do teach a lot of Tanakh. Um, I think I would argue that it's a function of numbers. There's a a um, the reality is that less so in Israel, but certainly in in uh, outside of Israel, the, uh, uh, the the sector of the Jewish world today that takes within the Orthodox gamut within the Orthodox spectrum that uh, takes a literal reading of most of these midrashim um, is much larger, and so we're still fighting a, 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 a sort of a struggle on that front. Um, but I think there's no question that the presentation that I shared with you today, I think, is certainly the more authentic approach um, than that of uh, you know, the Chazanish's presentation that, with which the source that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, Chazal were clearly of the opinion that uh, you know, these kinds of midrashic statements were there to, kind of, to give us food for thought, not necessarily um, a, a literal reading, nor were they monolithic. You know, some of the most right. famous midrashic positions were argued by other rabbis in the Talmud, and we don't right. know that. Right. So I think it's a function of intellectual honesty and, and, and openness, and um, yeah, there's a... I guess anyway, there's a I, I thank you. I mean, you, you, you are doing your share of trying to push this position, and I, uh, I, I personally applaud you for that. It's my pleasure. Thank it's you. My honor. No problem.
Okay. Any other uh, questions? No. Oh, what do you want to know? Are you related to Rabbi Nissen Sh uh, Shulman? Yes. Uh, yes. He, that, Rabbi Nissen Shulman is my father. Yes. My now husband My husband says now he understands. Okay. <laughs> the apple did not fall far from the tree. Thank you very much. I, I would ask where you know my parents from, but... Uh, um, well, we, we live in Manhattan. Yeah, I, I, worked, I worked with your father at YU for many years. Thank you. My husband is Moshe Sokolo. I don't know if yes. you have come I, across I, I that. I made name. that assumption when I saw when the conversation veered in that direction. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank okay. You. So uh, thank I thank both of you. Thank you. Okay. My pleasure. Thank you all Good. for joining us. And next week, week we will see you again, I hope. Hope so. Bye-bye. Take care.